Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with two remarkable women. First is Jerry Mock, who died recently at the age of 88. Jerry Mock was a housewife from Bexley, Ohio. She had studied aeronautical engineering at Ohio State. And in 1964, she did what no woman had done before her. She circumnavigated the globe in her airplane. Amelia Earhart had tried in 1937, but got lost in the South Pacific, and it wasn't until 27 years later that she accomplished the feat in 1964. A lot of people don't realize it, but Central Ohio is one of the centers of flight in the United States. It's where the Wright brothers grew up, and a month after her historic flight, she appeared on the game show to tell the truth, and I'm going to include a little bit of that, including her questioning from Orson Bean, who was quite a funny guy. My name is Jerry Mock. Only one of these ladies is the real Jerry Mock. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. Please open your envelope and follow along, if you will, as I read. I, Jerry Mock, am a wife and mother. Recently, I took a month's vacation from my husband and three children. Alone in our 11-year-old family airplane, I flew some 23,000 miles. In so doing, I became the first woman in history to fly an airplane completely around the world. Signed, Jerry Mock. <laughs> Orson B. Number uh, two, I've heard that in uh, Arabia, which takes in a great many countries, there are sheiks and potentates and nawabs who are only too anxious to get their hands on a nice American lady who lands all around the plane. How did you fend them off? I mean, a nice looking lady like you? Did you have any of that trouble? They kept waiting for a man to get out of the plane. <laughs> oh, did they? Well, uh, uh, number three, I mean, now, uh, you left your husband alone for 29 days. What did he do? I mean, who cleaned up the house and all? Who, looked, who cooked for the kids? His mother came and stayed there. His mother? Uh. She was number three there. Orson Bean, by the way, was not a sexist guy. He was just a funny guy and liked to goof on the television program. Here, Jerry Mock talks about her flight. As to why I did it, I've always admired people like Amelia Earhart, Lindbergh, and the old-time explorers, and I just wanted to be a part of the world that they lived in. Was there ever a time that you were ever frightened? No, not at all. There were times when I was tired and wished I could take a couple of days to rest, but I was never frightened. Well, Jerry, you demonstrated quite dramatically that flying is not as dangerous a pastime as many people believe. I don't think it's dangerous. To tell the truth, I feel much safer in my little airplane than I do in a great big one. Because I know what's happening when I'm flying the airplane and in a big one when you're in the back end. I don't know. I think when I got to the Azores, Bermuda still seemed rather close to home and I talked to my husband on the phone every day, but the Azores was far away. You were the first woman to do this since Amelia Earhart tried, right? Yes, as far as I know. Why do you suppose in all this time no one else has been able to do it? One of the reasons is that they didn't know it hadn't been done. I didn't realize this myself. I am sure there are many, many qualified women pilots who could do it. We're going to move on now to Marion Seldes, who died recently at the age of 86. She was one of the first ladies of the American theater. She was in every performance of Death Trap for eight years. She won a Tony in 1967 for A Delicate Balance, and in 2010, she won a Tony Lifetime Achievement Award. A little trivia, she was married to Julian Clayman, who was the producer of Have Gun, Will Travel, so she got a couple of episodes of that in 1957 and 1958 with Richard Boone, and then she was married to Carson Cannon, who wrote Born Yesterday. Here she talks a little bit about the theater, starting with her long run in Death Trap in the 1970s and 80s. It gives you a sense of uh, belonging to the New York theater community. It's wonderful. And then when the eight years on Broadway were over, I felt bereft. I thought, this isn't my street anymore or my theater anymore. And the next play I was in ran five performances. But I think people always say, well, how did you do it all that time? Well, there's a wonderful phrase that William Gillette, a great American actor, said he played Sherlock Holmes for years mm. and years. And people would constantly say to him, how can you play the same part? And he would say, the important thing in the theater is the illusion of the first time. Once you've heard that phrase, you can never forget it. Mm -hmm. The audience has never seen it, and you are not supposed to have lived it before. <laughs> Just remember that when you do it. Here are some of her other thoughts on the theater. Something you have to learn in the theater, which is not to criticize your fellow actor. Not, no, I'm difficult. not talking about the Very director, difficult. but and if someone is doing something that's driving you mad, 
you are supposed to go to the stage manager uh -huh. and say, is that the correct thing or whatever, whatever, yes. you know, because otherwise you have this strange feeling that while you're acting, a critic is watching you. You know, the freedom of being able to do what you've rehearsed and just picking it up from the other actor is so wonderful. But the minute it becomes a critic, it's hard to do, isn't mm -hmm. it? It doesn't happen very often. But I wonder how the young actors learn this, because sometimes a very young actor will just tell you something to do. There's sort of a, sort of a way of behaving in the theater, you know. Mm -hmm. No way to learn it. No, yeah. except in the theater, yes. right? I once stood by for Irene Worth oh. in Tiny Alice, and the scenes she plays are with the man, in this case played by John Gilgood. I began my whole career with John Gilgood, because he directed uh, Judith Anderson in Medea. And I adored him to this point where once one of the uh, assistants of, of his said to me, you know, you must stop staring at John in rehearsal because he can't work. I said, I don't stare at him. And of course I did. <laughs> I never took my eyes off him. But is... all of us have been that standby or that understudy. Yeah. And it's thrilling when you get the Wonderful. chance. And when you're young, you don't trust that what you've got is enough. People say, well, just jo uh, George Cukor once said to me, I'm going to give you some very important uh, direction, Mary, and I gave it to Kate Hepburn. Only do what you do. And you think, yes, but what if that's not good enough? You see, well, now we do what we do. We bring what we've got to the, to the table, so to speak. In the beginning, it's hard to trust yourself. Did I speak too quickly when I said I do what I want to do? It's, it's not what, because how do you know what the director wants? The director probably hasn't even spoken to you. Some assistant has said, come on in here. Quite, we find out as we grow older that other people's lives, not necessarily theater lives or actors' lives, are very like ours. There's no profession where it's easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Mm -hmm. Then it better be love the art love the theater, want to be there. We're in close tonight with Paul Dick, who died at the age of 76, but he dropped the Dick from his name, and I don't know whether his middle name was really Revere or not, but he made it his name, and he became Paul Revere, and he was the leader of Paul Revere and the Raiders, one of the great garage band groups of the 60s. They had a 10-year career, and they put out some of the best songs you heard during the 1960s. He came out of Idaho with his friend Mark Lindsay. He went to school in Pocatello. One of them was in the same high school as Larry Lujak. I'm not sure which one. And they gravitated towards Portland, Oregon, and they created a party band that became a garage rock band. They were originally known as the Downbeats. And their first song was a song called Like Long Hair. Long Hair was a reference to classical music, the parody of classical music, and it was a local hit in Portland. <laughs> They changed their name to Paul Revere and the Raiders. He was a funny guy. They dressed in Revolutionary War outfits. And the big party hit in the Great Northwest in those days was by the Kingsmen. Louie Louie, everybody's familiar with it. The Raiders did a version. A lot of people think it's better than the Kingsmen. Columbia heard and gave him a record contract. <laughs> party band, but then things happened that changed their lives. The British invasion, and they were hit being Revolutionary War guys from America. They moved to Southern California. Dick Clark caught their act and made them the house band for where the action is, and they got Terry Melcher, Doris Day's son, to be their producer, and he turned out a lot of great records. From 65 to 67, they turned out great records. This is their first hit in the middle of the British invasion, Just Like Me. It's the one that put them on the charts. <laughs> Just like me, shady, of 
Almost all of them had great intros, and of course the best is the one that I played for the Jerry Goff and Close a couple of weeks back, Kicks. It's my ringtone. Animals didn't want it. Raiders took it to the top of the charts. <laughs> They followed it up with Hungry, almost as good a song, great intro, and this song screams 1966 Garage Rock. <laughs> They followed that one up with another great song with a great intro, Good Thing. Melcher was hot and the Raiders were hot. <laughs> Seven guys are getting drafted. They're fighting with Melcher. Sergeant Pepper's coming out, and they're still turning out great records. One more from that era I really like. Great intro, Mr. Sun, Mr. Moon. McCartney may borrow this intro when he was with Wings. <laughs> Anyway, 1971 was their last big year. They were only big for a decade. Lindsay was going solo and bounced back and forth. They had their last number one with a John D. Lottermilk song, Indian Reservation. Remember, John D. Lottermilk wrote A Rose and a Baby Ruth, which we closed with for George Hamilton IV a couple weeks back. <laughs> close on that note, I want to thank my producer Sid Tepps. Can you believe these guys aren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, even though they're the great garage rock band of the 60s? Paul Revere was a hard-working, creative guy, and we're going to close with a song you don't hear very much. It was recommended to me by my rock maven friend Bill, and he picked a great one. Introduced by the Smothers Brothers, who loved him, put him on the show in 67. It's called Louie Go Home. This is the album cut. And now we'd like to present a group of youngsters who, even though they've been around for something like 190 years, have just recently shot to the top. Paul Revere and the Raiders. Uh -huh. 